discussed in the beginning, Frederick is, and Zangenberg in general are looking at this from you know, the commercial contract side, looking towards the technology, and we're a technology company, uh, but get very much involved in a lot of the contractual discussions, and we sort of meet in the middle here. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, a lot of these same things, but just seen more from the uh, uh, technology uh, uh, side. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, talking about uh, just understanding what, what you pay for. And a lot of this uh, Frederick's already discussed, so I'm not going to go into details here. But uh, as he mentioned, uh, you know, your, your price is going to depend on a lot of stuff. You know, it's not just the CPU, uh, it's also the storage, memory, software, backup, security, lots of terms and conditions are all going to be baked into the price. And it's important to understand all those components when you're comparing prices to make a, an apples to apples comparison. Um, what I'm going to focus on is the CPU based pricing because often outsourcers roll a lot of these other things into the CPU based pricing. So when you pay you know, 1,000 euros per MIPS per year, you know, that's going to uh, reflect uh, a lot of terms and conditions and a lot of software and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, just again, starting at the bottom with the technology, uh, we have some processors. Uh, in the old days, they were just general processors. Uh, we call them GPs or GCPs or CPs, and they can run everything. Uh, and then IBM invented this uh, thing called the ZIP. Uh, physically, it's just a GP. Uh, there's no real difference. But there's a little bit of microcode there that prevents you from using all the functionality of the GP. Uh, so it's primarily designed to run, you know, certain types of DB2 workload, but, but other stuff can also use SIPs. Uh, and it's important to understand this is not a techno technological invention, this is a commercial invention. This is a way of IBM providing a discount to customers running certain types of workload in order to remain competitive. Uh, similarly, there's something called the IFL, uh, which is uh, primarily for, for running uh, Linux workloads. So again, it's a limited functionality, same physical uh, chip, but with some limited functionality, so it can only run Linux. And again, this is a way of IBM providing some discount to the people running Linux in order to remain competitive. So when we talk about measuring uh, how much capacity you're using in order for the outsourcer to bill you, uh, we need to get some of the basic measurement uh, concepts in place here. Basically, all measurement starts with measuring CPU seconds. This is the number of seconds that the machine has been busy doing work for you. Um, and it's something that's measured directly by the operating system. It's actually the only thing that's really measured directly by the operating system. Uh, and uh, it can be read directly in the SMF records. Um, it's not normalized, so uh, a piece of work that's going to take uh, three CPU seconds on one uh, hardware configuration might take four or five or, or even more on another hardware configuration. And for that reason, we generally don't see CPU seconds used as a basis for billing the customers. In the cases where you are using CPU seconds, it's very important that the contract specifies how you normalize these CPU seconds if the, if the outsourcer chooses to change the underlying hardware configuration. Um, and then we have MIPS. Uh, originally, MIPS stood for a million instructions per second, but it no longer really has any relation to the number of instructions being executed. People often refer to it as uh, uh, misleading information about processor speed rather than a million instructions per second. Um, but it's a nice way of normalizing CPU utilization across different hardware uh, configurations. So if you're running a, a particular workload on one hardware configuration, it should use basically the same number of MIPS if you move it to another hardware configuration. And that's why it's really nice for, for billing. Um, the complicated part is it's not something you can measure directly. It's something you have to calculate based on CPU seconds. We'll discuss that a little bit more uh, in a minute, how that calculation happens. Um, and then there's MSUs. Uh, as uh, Frederick also mentioned, uh, MSUs uh, originally stood for a million service units. Uh, it's calculated based on factors determined by IBM, because IBM uses it for billing. And it's some sort of black magic that goes on in the operating system where it takes the CPU seconds, 
and normalize it based on some factors that it determines. In theory, like MIPS, it's going to help you normalize your utilization across different uh, hardware platforms. But as Frederick also mentioned, you know, IBM does have a tendency to also put some commercial consideration into the MSU calculation. So traditionally, they've given you uh, a, a few more uh, MSU per, per uh, uh, a, a little bit more performance for, for the new models, uh, and so baked a software discount into the MSU calculation. Now, that's been uh, happening until fairly recently, actually, as I understand from the Z13 to the Z14, they've kept the same numbers here. But it's something uh, to keep an eye on. Um, there's some other complexity about MSU. Uh, just for historical reasons, MSU means one of five different things. You know, it can be the, there's something called hardware MSUs, uh, and there's roughly five to five and a half MIPS to a hardware MSU. And then there's a software MSU, which is roughly eight to eight and a half. Originally, these were the same, but as IBM continued to give discounts on the software MSU, they diverged. Um, and then there's the rolling four-hour average of these measurements uh, as logged by the operating system on an ongoing basis. And then there's the hourly average of these uh, measurements as reported in the SCRT report, which IBM uses for, for billing. And then finally, there's the monthly peak of these rolling four-hour averages. And this is what your outsourcer is paying for uh, their software for. And some customers are also billed based on this. Um, so just comparing MIPS and MSU, MIPS is more spiky because it doesn't have this rolling four-hour average, and uh, uh, you know, MSU is a little bit uh, softer. The other thing to notice is you know, your peak MIPS and your peak MSU can be at completely different times. Typically, your peak MSU is going to lag uh, uh, behind the uh, uh, peak MIPS, but you could also uh, have a very uh, narrow peak MIPS, which is a completely different point in time. So again, it's very important to understand your usage patterns when you start negotiating a, a billing model if you're going to decide whether you want to go with uh, MSU or MIPS. Um, so a little bit advantages and disadvantages of these two uh, models for billing purposes. Uh, on MIPS, uh, as I said, it's directly computed uh, from CPU seconds in a hopefully transparent way. Uh, it's independent of IBM's pricing model. You can also use MIPS uh, both for CP and ZIP. There's no MSUs on ZIP. It's all uh, MIPS. Uh, and you can also compute it on all levels. So uh, while MSU you can only get at the LPAR level, MIPS you can calculate at the, uh, at the job level or transaction level. So it's more, it's more useful when you want to do a more granular analysis. Uh, disadvantages, as we saw in the graph, it can be spiky. Um, and also the computation method can be open to discussion. And this is why it's very important in your contract to have a very clear specification of uh, how your MIPS are calculated, and we'll come back to that. The advantages of the MSU is because of the rolling four-hour average, you're flattening out a lot of the spikes, and that's good for, for some usage patterns. Uh, it's measured directly. IBM determines how it is calculated, so there's no room for discussion. I mentioned IBM gives a bonus over time for upgrading to new hardware. As an outsourced customer, you, as Frederick said, you might want to make sure you get some of that bonus. Um, and it gives an alignment of interest uh, between you and the outsourcer. The outsourcer is paying for MSU. If you're also paying for MSU, uh, that, can, uh, that can be a good thing. Disadvantages of MSUs, obviously, it's affected by IBM's pricing policy. Both you and the outsource are a little bit in IBM's pocket if they decide to change the uh, calculation method. Um, it can only be measured at the LPAR level. If you want to start doing cost allocation at the transaction or job level, you can't use MSUs. And it's only useful for, for CPs. You can't use MSUs on, on ZIPs. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, there's these five definitions of MSUs. You have to be very clear on which one you're using. Good. I said MIPS uh, are calculated uh, based on CPU seconds. So let's just go through the calculation. Um, it's really CPU seconds times a configuration dependent uh, MIPS factor. You know, as, as Frederick mentioned, this is the rating of the processor. Uh, for contractual purposes, we generally uh, determine the MIPS factor or the rating based on two things. One is you know, what's the uh, um, effective model that we're running on uh, determined by the number of CPUs? Uh, 
and then uh, uh, MIPS per CPU delivered by that model, which we look up in a table, the IBM LSPR table or Watson Walker. Um, there's a lot of other factors can, can, can affect the number of MIPS you actually get. Uh, and so it's important to separate you know, the contractual MIPS, uh, which is sort of a, uh, an artificial concept to, to the actual MIPS that you know, the hardware is going to be delivering for you, which is going to be affected by your workload characteristics. You know, you'll, you'll get more, uh, b better performance or, or, or more work done per MIPS in batch than in online and things like that. Vertical affinity, we'll talk about overall system load. You know, how much is the outsourcer loading the entire system is going to affect your MIPS and system overhead and a lot of other stuff, some of which I'll come back to. Um, I, I like to think about MIPS, if you're buying, you know, your CPU capacity by MIPS, MIPS defines the size of the bottle. Uh, if you think of, uh, you know, the CPU capacity as water. If you don't have a good definition of the size of the bottle and you're just saying, you know, I'm paying per bottle, th then you have a problem. So let's go through those steps one at a time, finding the effective model. Um, the effective model is determined by the hardware model and the number of processors. So the more processors there are, uh, the more overhead, and the fewer MIPS there are delivered per CPU second. Uh, and newer models generally deliver more MIPS per CPU than older ones. So that's why it's interesting to find the effective model. Here's an example of Z13 with uh, 33 processors, delivers about uh, 1,071 MIPS per CP. If you add two more processors to that configuration, it's going to reduce the MIPS rate to uh, about 1,060. Uh, and normally the outsource is going to compensate for this in the MIPS calculation by uh, adjusting the MIPS factor every time they, they change the, uh, the machine configuration. Um, and here's a, just a cur curve showing you know, how dramatically the MIPS rate uh, drops as you add more processors to a machine. Good. There's some pitfalls in doing this. Um, you know, one is uh, we've seen some outsourcers that calculate the MIPS as if the LPAR were a standalone machine. So if you have an LPAR with, uh, with three uh, uh, logical CPUs, it's going to say, well, this is the same as, as a physical machine with just three processors. Uh, and that, of course, gives a much higher MIPS rate than you're actually going to be able uh, get delivered, and it's, it sort of defeats the purpose of having a stable MIPS calculation across configurations, because if you add one more logical processor to that uh, LPAR, then suddenly you get a very, uh, very, very, very different MIPS rate uh, for doing the same work. Uh, another pitfall we've seen is including only the CPs in determining the model. The zips also have an effect on the total system overhead. Our recommendation is to take the total number of CPs and the total number of ZIPs, add them together to determine the, uh, the model. But there's a lot of discussion about you know, how much the ZIPs really do uh, contribute with overhead. Um, so there's no absolute truth here. The most important thing is it's well defined in your contract. Um, another pitfall is using MIPS tables based on the outsourcer's own methods or methodologies. Uh, you want to have some independent, industry-recognized MIPS table rather than just letting your outsourcer determine the, uh, the, the MIPS rate for the, for the machine. Uh, at least if you're going to do that, uh, then you need a very clearly defined mechanism for benchmarking new machines so you jointly agree on the MIPS rate. Um, yeah, and there's lots of creative models out there. Uh, I won't go into all of them. Uh, Probably the worst situation is when you have a contract which just says MIPS without any specifi uh, specification of how the MIPS are calculated. This is like buying water by the bottle without saying how big the bottles are. Good. So now we've found the uh, uh, effective model and uh, the number of processors that we can just go into a table like the Watson-Walker MIPS table and look up the MIPS rate per processor for that machine. Uh, here we use average RNI. I'll come back to RNI in a minute. Um, uh, and then we do the, uh, the calculation. For billing purposes, MIPS are normally calculated uh, over an hour. So we take the number of CPU seconds that you've used during that hour, divide by 3,600, which is the number of seconds in an hour, and multiply that by the MIPS per processor. Um, so if we use 1,000 CPU seconds on the Z13 we looked at before, 
uh, we get uh, uh, 297.5 groups. Uh, I mentioned RNI. This is a complex subject, but it's very important. Um, RNI uh, is um, how effective uh, the processor is on your workload. Uh, it's, RNI refers to relative nest intensity. How deeply does uh, your program have to go into the memory nest to find its data? If it's finding its data in the level one cache, it's going to run real fast. If it has to go to, the, to a level three or level four cache, it's going to waste cycles while it's waiting to get that memory. So the deeper you go into the cache, uh, the, the less effective work you're getting done per MIPS. Uh, and just to confuse things, IBM always uh, ex explains high, high RNI means deep into the memory nest uh, and gives a low MIPS rate, low RNI gives a high MIPS rate, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's important to understand this. Uh, and it has a big effect on the MIPS. Uh, as you can see, the orange line is the one we saw before. Uh, blue is a low RNI, which shows a significantly uh, higher effective MIPS rate. And a, a high RNI is going to give you a much lower MIPS rate. And this is interesting because there's some things you can do about it, but also some things your outsourcer can do that's going to affect your RNI. Uh, so for example, batch is typically going to be a lower RNI. You're going to get more done per... Uh, per dollar or per euro, um, whereas transactional workload is typically going to uh, have a higher INI. Um, but also, uh, you know, some of the things like that the outsourcer can affect, like vertical affinity we'll talk about in a minute, can affect uh, RNI. Some best practice on MIPS calculation. Uh, one is, uh, you know, have a clear definition of MIPS in your contract. I'm not going to stand here and say there's a right way to calculate MIPS. Uh, but you definitely need to have a very clear definition of it that everybody understands. Uh, and we've seen lots of cases where we go in and help an outsource customer uh, uh, validate uh, the invoice they're getting from the outsource, and we find out that they're actually billed incorrectly compared to the contract. And this isn't because the outsource is trying to cheat them, it's just this is complicated. And sometimes the commercial people writing the contract and the technical people actually extracting the information for the billing, uh, you know, don't coordinate well, and uh, they end up not not. Um, our recommendation is determine the uh, uh, effective model based on the number of CPs plus the number of zips. So if you have thirty three CPs and two zips, then you use a thirty five uh, processor machine when you look up in the table. And of course, you're only looking at the shared processors, so anything uh, that's dedicated or offline is not included. You want to use a MIPS table from a, a uh, recognized uh, industry standard independent source. Uh, we use Watson Walker, uh, but uh, LSPR is also another good one. Gartner is also commonly used. Uh, use the average RNI for contractual purposes, and then base the measurements on the CPU seconds as measured in the SMF70. Uh, SMF70 will give the total usage for, for the LPAR. Uh, some of the other SMF records don't give you a complete picture of the, of the CPU usage. Uh, and then the other best practice is ensure you have good reporting. I mean, you need to be able to go in and validate uh, the outsourcer's invoice. You need access to the data uh, that they're doing those calculations based on. Good. Um, there's a lot of ways of going from MIPS uh, or MSU to money. Uh, and for the outsourcer, it's fairly simple. They're paying for their typically their four-hour peak rolling average MSU, uh, and that's driving most of their costs. But uh, there's an enormous amount of creativity in terms of how the outsourcers build their customers. Uh, here's some of the common ones we've seen, you know, peak MIPS per month. Uh, peak rolling for our average MSU, or peak rolling for our average MIPS per month, uh, peak hour during working hours, during working days. This is actually not that uncommon. We see a lot of outsources that have spare capacity at night and during the weekends. They have their peak 10 o'clock in the morning uh, on Mondays. And so they say, any capacity you use outside of working hours, you can use for free. Uh, and, and this is actually a win-win. Uh, for the customer and the outsourcer, because it helps move things away from, from their billing peak. Um, we've seen percentile peak. This is quite common that you know you throw away the top uh, 
you know, 10 or 20 uh, peaks during the month. Um, you want to also look at, are you looking at calculating your peaks for each LPAR independently, or are you going to stack the LPARs first and then find the peak? Uh, you know, one is good for you, and the other one is good for your outsourcer. Corresponding with CP and SIP, are you looking at peaks CP and SIP independently, or are you stacking them together and looking at the peak? Um, we also see a lot of uh, billing models just based on fixed capacity. So, you know, you have, it's based on your weight or capping or something like that. We'll come back and talk briefly about weight and capping. Um, yeah, and there's also, you know, total or average usage during the month, bans, you know, penalties for using too much or too little, and then combinations of the above. A very common combination is, you know, some sort of peak based uh, on the CP, but some sort of capacity based on, on, on the zip. So a little bit of best practice about all these uh, billing models. You know, you want to work towards alignment of interest with your outsourcer. You know, if you're having a billing model that is, you know, sort of in conflict uh, or creates friction with what the outsourcer is paying, then that's probably not good for either of you. Um, ensure transparency. You know, you want to make sure you have access to data uh, and reporting so you can follow up on your outsourcer, but also have a good dialogue with them. Uh, understand your usage patterns. You know, rolling for our average will be good for some people, 95th percentile will be good for other people. If your usage patterns are changing because you're moving some workload from batch to online or bringing new applications online, you know, consider reviewing your, your outsourcing uh, contract and, and looking at other models. Um, yeah, avoid complexity that doesn't add value. We've seen some wickedly complex uh, models, and the problem is, you know, nobody wants to, to spend the, the brain power understanding them. So you just kind of float along and say it's probably right. Uh, yeah, and then understand the relationship between cost and quality of service. Thanks. Um, so let me just come into that a little bit. Um, couple of concepts if we're going to talk about quality of service. One is, is, uh, is you know, how much capacity is the outsourcer providing you? Um, and here we talk about weight and capping. Now capping is actually a mechanism the outsourcer uses typically to control their own costs. It prevents you from using more than a certain amount of CPU. So if there's no capping on your LPAR, your maximum capacity is going to be determined by the number of logical CPUs times the MIPS rate. Um, if, uh, but that can be capped at a lower level than that. Um, and uh, there's different types of capping. There's hard capping, which says you can't go above that. And then there's soft capping, which lets you go above it for a while, but uh, then the four hour rolling average will be kept uh, at a certain level. So if you stay above that level a certain time, then you'll be pushed down. Um, and then there's the LPAR weight, and this determines your guaranteed or reserved capacity. Uh, in a lot of contracts, you know, it's, it's referred to as, as sort of the ordered capacity. Um, and then there's uh, another concept which we, we should just discuss is workload manager. Workload manager decides if you don't have enough capacity uh, on your LPAR, uh, which of your various workloads are going to get access to the capacity and which is going to be waiting. And this is where we would start talking about quality of service. If you have important workload that's waiting because there isn't enough capacity, uh, th then you need to have that under control. Um, so just uh, a little bit of best practice or pitfalls around this. Um, you know, it can affect your cost. It can affect your quality of service. Uh, ensure that's a clear mechanism for managing these things in your contract. Uh, don't just assume your outsourcer is going to uh, look out for your best interest when managing weight and capping and WLM. Uh, and ensure that you have transparency into these things through the SMF70, SMF72, and WLM policies. Some of the pitfalls we've seen, you know, outsourcers doing group capping across multiple customers. So if one customer is using too much capacity, then the other ca uh, customer gets, uh, gets capped, uh, which cannot, is not a good idea. Um, we've also seen peak-based pricing with no capping. Now, I said capping is typically something the outsourcer does for their own interest, but you can have a strong interest in, uh, in having capping, particularly prevent uh, you know, your batch at night from running up and, and creating peaks. Um, 
too low guaranteed capacity or capping compared to a high priority workload, and sort of assuming that you're allowed to go over your weight because the outsourcer typically has spare capacity at that point in time. Um, and then WM, w, WLM policy is not aligned with business priorities. A lot of the outsourcers say, we took over this WLM policy when we took over the customer 10 years ago, we haven't touched it because only the customer knows what their priorities are. So this is something that has to happen in a close dialogue between the customer and the outsourcer. Uh, and typically the way the outsourcers handle this is just making sure the customer has as much capacity as they need, so they're never constrained, so WLM never has any work to do, and that also optimizes the outsourcer's uh, uh, re revenue. Good. Uh, the last topic is really just on following up. Uh, what do you need to keep an eye on all this? SMF 70 is probably the, the key uh, thing that you need. This will tell you the overall hardware configuration and the things you need to calculate the MIPS. Uh, also, the SMF 70, in addition to giving you the total conf uh, configuration, will tell you how each of your LPARs is configured with logical CPUs, what the weight is, what capping is going on there. Um, Another thing you need to be able to, to monitor, which you can also see in the SMF 70, is what we call zip eligible. Um, zip eligible is when you have something that could run on the zip, which is going to be much cheaper, but it ends up running on a CP uh, because uh, there isn't enough zip allocated to your, uh, to your LPAR. So you end up paying the high price rather than the low price. And so it's up to the outsourcer to ensure you have enough zip capacity uh, but you also need to be able to look over their shoulder. We see an example on the right here where the, the light blue LPAR is suddenly using one full, uh, or its full allocation on, on that LPAR of zip, but it wants to use more, so it's spilling over on the bottom graph. We see the zip eligible that is uh, MIPS being used on a CP at a much, much, much higher price. So it's very important to get transparency into this. Uh, vertical affinity, just talk very briefly about that. Uh, modern mainframes basically provide three vertical affinities, low, medium, and high. High means that every time you, get, you go back to your processor, you're going back to the same place. So the chance of finding your data in the cache and being able to run very effectively is quite high. With low, you're sharing your processor with a lot of people. When you come back to your processor, someone else has trashed your cache, you're going to have to go out and get your, your data from memory again and waste cycles doing that. So you get a much uh, more value uh, for your money on a high CPU. Um, so it's very important to be able to monitor this. And uh, uh, just this graph here shows the blue line is weight. A very small adjustment in weight on your LPAR can affect uh, this. Well, here we see uh, a slight increase in weight. Uh, suddenly one of the processors is converted from a medium to a high. So this customer is getting much, much more work done per dollar, per euro uh, after that configuration change was made. And most outsourced customers are not aware of this and don't have the ability to follow up on it. Uh, RNI we talked about before. You can also monitor that with the SMF 113. Uh, here we see an example where the RNI is suddenly increasing. Uh, and the bottom graph, you can see the, uh, uh, the amount of uh, data that we're finding in the close cache, the level two private cache, is falling. So it's going further out into memory to find its data, wasting cycles doing that. So you're getting less useful work done. Uh, response time is another important one to monitor, uh, you know, because you know, by saving money, putting in capping and stuff like that, that could hurt your response time. And for most customers, Good response time, good quality service for the customers is more important even than, than saving uh, money. Yeah, and again, monitoring your quality of service is understanding what's going on in WLM. Are your WLM policies set up right? There's a few things we can look at there, the performance index and the velocity. We can also look at uh, how much time is spent waiting on various things in WLM. Are you waiting for the CPU? Are you waiting for disk? Uh, so good reporting based on the SMF 72 to allow you to follow up on this will we'll, we'll let you know, you know, is your WLM policy set up uh, well uh, and are you getting enough capacity for the work that you need to do and the goals you have. Uh, yeah, and then finally, uh, identifying applications for tuning. Uh, probably where we actually spend most of our time as a company is helping customers understand 
their billing model and understanding what they can do about their billing model. So here we have an example with a customer paying for we identify where the peak is, we kind of open it up and identify, well, that's batch uh, that's going on during their Friday night peak. See which batch jobs is it that are running. And then decide, do we want to reschedule those? Uh, do we want to put some capping in? Uh, do we want to do some system tuning? Or do we need to go in and tune these applications? Uh, but it's very important for you as customer also be able to do this kind of analysis because your outsourcer is probably not going to be doing this for you. So just to uh, finish up here, in summary, uh, just remember uh, an outsourced environment is usually a shared environment, so there will be compromises. You get a huge number of advantages by outsourcing. Uh, as Frederick uh, mentioned, you know, the price per MSU falls uh, dramatically as you get to larger and larger uh, machines. So this you know, economies of scale is something that you participate in when you're an outsourced customer compared to having your own environment. Uh, but there are compromises. Um, the most important thing is having a clear and common understanding with your outsourcer of what are you paying for, how is it measured or calculated, and how do you monitor it, uh, and then what can you do about it when you see your costs increasing um, so having good access to reporting tools, you know, ideally some self-service reporting so you don't need to ask your uh, uh, outsourcer for reports every time you want to look into this. And then having access to an independent, trusted advisor if you don't have the skills in-house. And here both SMT Data and Zangenbeer have, have a lot of uh, yeah, world-class resources to help you with this.